just love you all <laughs> for being here. Bring your energy, and your energy is primarily positive about the future of this world. And this is all we need, is that positivity. I'm sort of at a loss for words, because whenever I hear Edgar say this, it just moves me. Because here was a man who was the most gear-heady person you could imagine, Navy pilot. He had piloted the lunar module to the surface. Now that's a real gearhead operation. And on the way back, he had a time to have peace. That's an important clue about the connection we all seek. And so he was open to this experience that was delivered to him from somewhere, this epiphany, this oneness. So my story that I'm going to tell you today is a lifelong quest for the connection with that oneness, with the field. Because I think that the field is the greatest tool that we'll ever have as a hominid, the greatest tool that we grasp with our hominid hand. It's the connection with that field. And that field of synchronicities is growing stronger and stronger every moment. And it's coming into coherence, and we are coming into awareness with it. And that field is our companion. That field is going to take us forward. It's going to take us across that threshold. Because wouldn't it be good if we had a companion to take us across the threshold we know is coming? Wouldn't it be good? Wouldn't it feel better? You can reach out and touch it. It can guide your own life intimately and exquisitely. So just to re-roll the clock, when I was nine, our father, Warren Damer, would read The Lord of the Rings to us in bed. I loved Gandalf, and I think I'm becoming Gandalf the Grain. <laughs> But he read it to us when we were nine, just because there's some scary parts. You know, my brother and I were clutching each other at times. But when I would close my eyes to go to sleep, I noticed there were flashes behind closed eyes. All this color was going on. I thought, this is cool. This is better than color TV, and we don't have color TV. This is 1969, 70, something like that. And uh, I said, how do I make these flashes of color get stronger? Well, I'll just minimize myself so that I'm not thinking at all. I'm not having thoughts about what to do tomorrow or worries or anything. And I went, oh. And then the flashes turned into worlds. And I think every little kid does this. They can become a separate observing being. And then worlds open for them. You've seen kids playing. You know, they are already in the magic. They're already connected with that field. So for me, that moment was, oh, there's a space. If I just minimize myself, the space is filled with this wonder and all this stuff. So it's entertainment, too. So in school, I could daydream, you know, really good. <laughs> school got boring sometimes. I was in my world. Then when I was turning 10, I thought, if there's a world, if there's a space you can connect with, what about uh, if I could communicate and make a request of it? And like this countdown clock, down below me, this dreaded clock, <laughs> uh, my odometer was about to roll from 9 to 10. <laughs> and I, I was a nerdy kid. I was a gearhead. And gears ran odometers in cars. And I would study them as the numbers moved. And if the numbers went to all zeros, like I would make notes. Car just passed 10,000, you know, things like this. I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, but anyway, my odometer was going to move from 9 to 10, like two digits. Oh, it's going to be a long time before I move to three digits. I got to do something about this. So I went out on a long walk the day before my 10th birthday, and I said, OK, uh, let's see. Uh, 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 uh. I do. Oh, I know. This is about the future. Oh, yeah, okay. Because you don't know you're not supposed to be able to do this stuff. You do it when you're 10. So I said, I'm going to open a portal to the future and see what happens. 
my future selves, and they lined up. I could see shapes of myself all the way up. Ooh, decades and decades. Oh, that's cool. Can do that. Okay. Uh, oh, what do I do now? Uh, okay, they're all paying attention to me, like you are in this audience. Like they're all there. <laughs> they're all looking. That's cool. Uh, okay. So well, I got it. I'll write on my hand a contract that says what could be useful for my future. Uh, yeah. The future selves will never cast doubt or have regret about the previous selves. Because the previous selves did the best they could in the circumstances. And so I did, because I, I don't get this kind of thing coming down from the future. So I wrote it and I passed it to them and they signed it all. And then I felt this thing like, whoa, energy. I felt energy pouring through my system for the first time, and like, boom, it was positive. Like, there's no obstructions to anything now. It's all open. All these dreams now can come true, because it's all going this way. There's nothing coming back. Whew. You just go and go and go. Wow. There's a whole field out there. There's a network. Oh, it's lining up. Little things are firing. I can see them. They're lining it all up in advance. Wow. Don't have to sweat it. It's always going to work out. So, mm. walking out in the springtime at age 14 near our, my home in Kamloops, British Columbia. I don't know if anyone's been to Kamloops. But. It's a little cow town in the sagebrush in central BC in Canada. I noticed a mariposa lily coming out of the ground. And I thought, this is beautiful. It's complex, but it comes from a bulb. I knew that these were bulbs. They were perennials. And, and the bulb was simple. So how did a complex thing come out of a simple thing? And there were no computers in our, our town. There was no idea of programming at the time. And I looked around and I saw other mariposa lilies coming and think, oh my god, these things all come from simple things and go complex. And I, my mind was very realmy, I call it. It was like, let's rewind the clock four billion years. Let's go back. Oh. They all came from one thing, one simple starting point. That's interesting. They had to, because that's the trend. That they come from simple things and they get more complex. There was probably, like Stephen Hawking thought, well, there was probably one singularity in the Big Bang. OK, there was a Big Bang of biology. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> How did that get together? So I started walking back to my mom and dad's house and like, that's the origin of life. Isn't that that type? Yes, that's the origin of life. How do you solve these problems? Oh, I remember seeing a little TV show about Albert Einstein, and he did thought experiments. He, like, rode his bike like a madman. And then he had a dream one night that he was running alongside a beam of light, and he watched all the compression waves. And that, that's a special relativity. I thought, oh, that's how science is done. OK, that's easy. I can do that any time. But then suddenly I'm walking back and, whoa, there was a blob of molecules in my third eye, but I didn't know what a third eye was. It was like, oh, hello. I see you like tinker toys, moving. Like, I can ask you a question. How did life, and it asked me the question, figure out how I made a copy of myself? Uh, the 14-year-old brain, Automobiles are machines, you're a machine. Automobiles need big machines and need little machines. That's not a plausible question. Next. And the blob of molecules was just moving and I was studying it, trying to figure out its self-organization. It winked, if such a thing can wink. It said, work on it. <laughs> 40 years later, it came in another download. So why I'm bringing you these things, or these, these little tales, is that this connection with the field is real. And it's real for little kids. And if we can keep it alive in little kids and show them an exquisite way to notice when synchronicities happen and to follow their imagination, keep that burning in them, keep that going in them, they can just open the freaking cosmos. They can do anything. So that's an idea. I don't know if have you, any of you experienced this kind of thing when you were little out there. Yeah. So next, I want to bring you uh, 
some of the concerns we all have. So, grown up Bruce, well, I'm, some would argue I'm still not grown up Bruce. Uh, I had a word with the field the other day. I said to it, listen, humanity is coming up against this incredible stress points. Well, let's rewind a bit. Let's come back to that. So, at life's origins, we now believe we have solved the mystery, or at least we're on hot on the trail to a plausible model. That life actually began not in the ocean, but in little warm pools connected to hot springs. Because hot springs have a magical property of cycling. You know, if you've been seen Old Faithful, it fills the pool and then the pool dries down and fills the pool on a clockwork basis. I mean, you can set your watch by Old Faithful. That's a powerful property, that clockwork cycling. Mm. So David Deemer had an intuition about that about 20 years ago and said, wet, dry cycling, because as you dry a pool down, it becomes more concentrated, and maybe the chemistry can somehow start. And when you rehydrate, you get a population of polymers. And it turns out that this works. And Dave pioneered this at UC Santa Cruz, and recently we went to an actual hot spring in New Zealand, in Rotorua, and I did the chemistry directly in, in the environment of the hot spring, and we got long strings of RNA from the basic building blocks. And when we put them under a microscope under fluorescence, when we put the little drop back in, to the little films of what are called lipid membranes, called a bathtub ring, if you will, it butted off trillions of compartments full of RNA. And it could be full of little peptides, too, and little DNAs, too. We can make those through the cycling system. Darwin's idea of the warm little pond was, was actually right on. But one of the things we discovered in that process is that uh, this is the big one for humanity. This is the big idea for the 2020s. I think of it this way. So when Albert Einstein had developed the theory of general relativity in 1916, 17, he had the opportunity to test it when there was an eclipse in 1919. It was correct. The theory was proven because a little dot of a star moved. The, the light from the star was bent around the sun by his prediction. So he became this wonderful scientific superstar with his hair out to here in a, a jalopy sitting next to Charlie Chaplin going through towns in America, people waving flags. I don't know if you've seen this, 1921. And the idea of relativity went into the culture and it rolled human culture. Because suddenly time was variable, it was plastic, so was space. And this is the post-World War I, post Spanish influenza, traumatized world, deeply traumatized. And suddenly, there was this flowering in the 1920s. Women's liberation started. The Bauhaus, uh, incredible new arts and theater, the sciences, uh, fascism, new forms of government started in the 1920s. Electronic communications, trade, and everything it was a rocking decade, the Charleston decade. And relativity came as a powerful scientific idea. But what we discovered in that pool in New Zealand last year was that if, if life started in these wet, dry cycles, one of the intuitions I had was, well, what happens when it's drying down and you have the little protocells, which are just the first inklings of a living system? They all clump together, just like you and this audience are clumped together. And there's a different feeling, right, when you're together in a group than when you're isolated. This is a fundamental principle that goes back to that time. That if a little fragile protocell that isn't even alive, but it's struggling through its evolutionary cycles, is a, apart from the group, it falls apart. It's friable, it's, it's, it can't survive. It can only survive in the little sludge, the little collection. And that could be 10,000 of them in this, what we call a gel, that we see at the bottom of the dishes. And if suddenly an epiphany occurred, this is the unit at the origin of life. Not the individual protocell, but the collective. Because the collective is a network effect. The collective protects itself against the environment, and it, and it co-evolves. 
So I thought for a second, that means that our common ancestor was a community, a simple form of community in collaboration. And I mentioned this to Dave, who's a gearhead like me, and his scientific answer was, yes, that would be selected for, which is scientific lingo for, that's the way this would happen. But if you go into philosophy, you go into spirit, you, you go into the feeling of ourselves, isn't it always that separateness creates destruction? If a little being grows up to be a world leader, but they have a little traumatized being inside them that keeps them separate from people, they're always lashing out, right? And because they're separate, the little being's needs are not being met. And they create all kinds of mayhem. Their personality, their, their protectors, their trauma, their, their managers create their personality to be very uncomfortable in the world, and they, they recoil from groups because their needs were not met. That's something really interesting, too. So combine the two things, that the origin of life and our deepest ancestor was a community in collaboration. Our future is a community in collaboration. Our survival, our very survival, is if we hold tightly to a community in collaboration. Hold tightly. And the way you bring the members into the community is to have compassion for when they feel separate. So for instance, if, you're, if your father was deeply disappointed with you of not becoming a scientist or a doctor, say, if my father had not been such a beautiful, generous person and had, and had constantly hit on me like, you need to do this, 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 and I didn't do it, I would carry that wound my whole life. It would shape all my interactions with, with people. So what I'd like to suggest is to create the coherence of community for our very survival. All the tools represented by many of you, the practitioners in this room, are critical. I consider those tools to be the number one most important technology of the 21st century. The tools of healing our little internal parts. The tools of resourcing those parts so they calm down, so they're not so active finding those parts that are deeply wounded. Dick Schwartz's work on internal family systems, uh, the work I'm doing with Luminous Awareness Institute, the tools are getting extremely refined now. And we can see rapid acceleration in people undergoing many other practices that you are all involved with. But if we recognize that internally we're a little kindergarten, you know, ever had that feeling sometimes? When you get up in the morning and there's a noise going on like, oh, we need to get this and we need to get the kids out, but then there's a panic about this and it's like there's little voices, little parts. We have inner, inner kindergartens. And, but those inner kindergartens are young beings. So the young, what does a young being need? What does a baby need when the baby's crying? It's probably hungry or needs to poop. So to meet their needs is simple. They need to be seen. They need to have care. They need to have slowing down. They need to be paid attention to. And those young beings that calm down, the whole system comes down. So in some ways, the origin of life has shown us a whole model that there's an origin of people as well in a communal complex that inhabits us. It was put there by lineage, it was put there by our deep experience, by our genes. And to come to love that community is a beautiful thing, to know oneself, as they say sometimes. So how does that land with everyone? So I'd like to... Uh, a bit of a, another fun personal story about how powerful the field is that's our companion and will help serve us. So I was walking up on, on Skyline. This is a wonderful walking area it's up here in the mountains above Silicon Valley. And importantly, I was like, I left my phone over there for no distractions. And my life has been amazing. I mean, I've 
been involved now in all my dreams of when I was nine or ten have come true. We have a model for the origin of life. We've shifted the whole field of science over to it. We came up with the design of a spacecraft that can use balloon enclosure around asteroids, introduce a gas, and stop their tumbling, shift them, move them, and move them across the solar system, and extract fuel from them, even minerals, and turn them into biospheres, into worlds. And you'll see that at 11.45 in my breakout. That has come. We've found a way, not only how life began in little compartments, but how to make little protocellular compartments and worlds in the solar system and allow life to it grow and extend to Gaia to reproduce. That now we have a technical solution for both. So I was just taking some time to just feel the amazement that this actually all happened. The synchronous field lined it all up. So I went on this hike and I did a, a thing that you should try sometime. I said, okay, all pretense, let's drop it. Face the field and said, I know what you're doing. <laughs> and I really appreciate it. Thank you for lining all those things up. Thank you for moving me in 1994, halfway between David Deemer and Peter Janiskins, my collaborators on these two great missions, and placing me exactly in the right place. Thank you for having me meet them both at the right times. The synchronicities are stunning, they're breathtaking. And thank you. Thank you for doing all that. And then I, I stood up and I said, and understand I see you. I know you're there. And the portal opened. This kind of funny square thing in my third eye, which I still don't know what it, that is. And it saw me. And I said to it, I will be your faithful follower. I will follow all of your instructions. Because I really trust you at this point. And so it, the portal closed, and as you continue to walk, it's like, whoa, I'm really now connected. <laughs> oh yeah, wow, every bird song, everything, just super synchronized, every step, and like, now you're on. Now you're like, the birds and the animals, they're completely connected with their environments. You're back to baseline, like, oh, I'm here, I'm in the forest. I'm where we evolved. And I get up to the top of the hill, and over on the right-hand side, uh, looking over the Pacific, is the Wallace Stegner Bench, named after a Stanford poet. And I walked over to it, and I sit in the center, and then suddenly I've moved over to the right, by the fields, like, okay, I moved, no, no, far right part, squeeze in, squeeze in, squeeze in, okay, you got it, got it, okay, right. And then three minutes later, I felt the energy of three people walking up behind me. And there was two men, uh, two women and a man. And they bustle over, because they see that there's a space on the bench. If I was in the middle, they would never have come, probably. And they said, well, can we sit here? <laughs> I said, sure. Uh, can we have lunch? Yes, yeah, sure, you can have lunch. And they offered me some of their lunch, and uh, we started to talk, and uh, I started to talk about work on the origin of life uh, at UC Santa Cruz, and things like this. It was always really casual. They're obviously very intelligent, very interesting beings. And I suddenly remembered that, oh yeah, I'll mention this. Two weeks ago, I was in front of a group of postdocs at a conference, and I said to them, to try to motivate them, that this origin of life work and all the experiments that we're designing now is at least five or six Nobel Prizes in this work to get them like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> or to motivate their careers. And then I, I told these three people, and I want to be the fuddy-duddy, gray-haired old guy in the back of the room in Oslo when you're getting a Nobel Prize and, you know, in biology or medicine, these things. And the man that was with the two women looked up and said, that's what I'm doing next week. <laughs> I said, really? He said, we're going to Stockholm. I'm sitting in the back of the room. I'm a buddy buddy. <laughs> and my graduate student's getting the Nobel Prize in economics. <laughs> and uh, 